Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Wenger, and I had the privilege of being Robertson Weiser's Yahoo student throughout middle school at San Diego Hebrew Day School. Mrs. Weiser is an incredibly talented and knowledgeable teacher, and she always left me with great inspiration, and I'm so excited to be here listening to her wisdom again tonight. She has taught for many years at San Diego Hebrew Day School and at Torah High School. And like I said, I've learned countless lessons from her about my Jewish identity and coming closer to Judaism. Um, so Mrs. Weiser never fails to leave us with great lessons and important wisdom about Judaism. And with that, um, I do want to remind everyone to mute themselves while Mrs. Weiser is speaking. And I'm excited to hear from her yet again. So I'll hand it over to you, Rabbit Singh Weiser. Okay. I'm on. Now? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Betty Weiser for those who haven't, well, you haven't seen me in a long time and who don't really even know me. Um, and let's begin because the hour is late. And thank you very much, Rivka, for that uh, introduction. Um, I appreciate it. I really, really do. Teachers live for that, okay, from what they hear from their students. Okay, we're going to start. This is obviously this week. This is it. We're, you know, this Shavuos is around the bend. So here we go. What was Hashem thinking? Okay, why did he create the world? Okay, was he bored? Was he lonely? This should sound familiar to you, Rivka. Was he bored? Was he lonely? Um, after all, Hashem has no needs, no wants, no desires. He's totally self-sufficient. He's totally self-reliant. There is nothing external to Hashem that he needs for his existence. So then why create the world? There's no purpose in it for him. He gets no benefit from it. He will exist and he will continue on and on and on and, and why create the world? So that's the big question here. Why did Hashem create the world? So according to what our rabbis feel is that to the best of their knowledge, the reason why Hashem created the world was out of chesed because he had, he wanted to bestow he wanted to give of his kindness and his goodness, which is the ultimate level of kindness and goodness. Um, and he wanted to give it to the world. He wanted to share it to the world with the world. Okay. He there was there was there was no reason for him to do this other than because he's tremendously kind and good. Okay, but um and this is why at he, by sharing of his kindness and his goodness, his chesed, then this allows us who are of a much lower level than Hashem to draw closer to him, which is a tremendous act of altruism, meaning that God creating the world was the greatest act ever done where, where Hashem does something and he himself gets nothing in return, meaning there's no benefit to Hashem for him creating the world. Once Hashem decides that he is creating a world to give of his chesed, to give of his kindness and goodness, and that's what he was thinking, that's where, where it comes from, then, it, then the next thought would be, well, I need something, some vehicle to accept that kindness and goodness, some vessel that would appreciate and that would benefit from that kindness and goodness. So God, you know, decided. What happened? One, one second. Sorry, Mrs. Weiser. Hold on. I accidentally muted you. One second. Let me just find where you are. Hold on. Because there are two. Okay. Did you, do you see where it says I asked to unmute you? Okay, Just thank you. Over. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Okay, so Hashem decided, once he decided that he was going to create a world because he wanted a share of his chesed, of his kindness and his goodness, he needed to create something that would accept it, that kindness and goodness, that would appreciate that kindness and goodness. And that is what he created were people, the human race. 
People are the only ones that got the only thing that God created that can actually appreciate the chesed and, and the kindness that God wants to bestow on, on the world. But God likes to name everything, as you know, everything has a name because in Judaism, a name reflects the essence of the thing that it names. That's why we're very, in terms of, as all my students know, I call them all by their Hebrew names because their Hebrew names reflect, in other words, what the hopes and aspirations are for, for that child. English names don't have that. Other, other language names don't have that. But in Judaism, the name reflects the essence of the thing itself and that's that's how god set up the world so here we go the name that god gives the human race at the beginning when he decides to create the world you ready is yisrael he gives them he gives the whole human race the name yisrael we see that there is a a this sentence is a mishnah in the beginning of each chapter in pirkei avot that says, call Yisrael, everybody, every Yisrael has a portion in the world to come. Yisrael is a concept. It's not the name of an individual as we might think. I have a son named Yisrael, but it's not, not at the beginning of time, not at the beginning when God decides to create the world. Yisrael is a concept. It's not the name of an individual, nor is it the name of a nation. It's the name of, 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 of the whole human race of humanity. And it's a contraction of the idea in Hebrew, mi shara'a el, those who see and appreciate Hashem, Yisrael, those who can see and appreciate Hashem in their daily life. And therefore, when Hashem creates the world, he creates people. He calls the humanity Yisrael with the idea that they will acknowledge and appreciate that there, that there's a God, there's a source who is giving them all, you know, giving them life and giving them all the all the kindnesses and goodnesses that the world has to offer us. Okay, so when the when the the sentence when this Mishnah appears, call Yisrael, even though really it's speaking about the Jewish people, but at this point in time, you could also refer to it as that anybody, any person uh, or, an, or any group, whatever it is, in, who appreciates Hashem, there's a portion in the world to come awaiting him. And you know, we have righteous Gentiles in the world. These are the, they're Yisrael too, because they, because of their actions in this world, they have a portion of Olam Haba, of the world to come waiting for them. So that was one of the first thoughts that God had when he created the world. He was going to do it out of a sense of giving up, sharing of his chesed, and he was going to create Yisrael, humankind, to, to benefit from it. But what was, okay, so what was this, what was humanity going to do in this world that, that God set up? So Yisrael, these pe people were going, uh, it's, it's very closely linked to, they were going to do, they, they, they were going to, you know, worship Hashem. They were going to, um, you know, they, they were going to, you know, serve, uh, serve Hashem. Okay. When God creates Adam, what does he do? He, he puts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. What does it say to us in Horatio right away in the second chapter? He puts them in the Garden of Eden. Why? to work the garden and to watch over the garden. Well, let me ask you a question. That garden was already there. All the, everything that needed to grow out of that garden was, you know, was growing and it, and it took care of itself. So what, he put man on the world so man could be a gardener? Is that, was that our purpose in the world? So the idea of what, what does that mean to work it and guard it? So what the Medrash says is that to work, uh, to work, it means to, to, in other words, that they, that man would perform any, all of the, po any positive commandment that God gives him or her. And to guard it would mean any, that he would watch and he would be very scrupulous and be very careful in any of the negative commandments that Hashem gives. 
So it's really referring to, in a metaphorical sense, it's referring to this idea that Hashem, that, that mankind, our job in this world is for avoda, is to serve Hashem by doing positive commandments and being very careful about not transgressing or, or his negative commandments, any commandments that God will give mankind at that time. And we know that the very first commandment has both a positive and a negative component in it. The very first commandment that Hashem gives to Adam and you know, to Adam is the idea that you should eat from all the tree, the fruits of the tree in the garden. Okay, so that's positive. Eat, eat from it, enjoy it, but don't eat from the fruit in the tree in the middle of uh, of the garden. That's the negative comp uh, component. So right away, there you have the, the first command, and Adam, who's the prototype for all of mankind, he fails at this avoda. He fails at this service. He's one commandment and he blows it, okay? So that's what we have over there. But the idea of Yisrael, mankind, as doing avoda, as doing, in other words, as practicing, you know, um, in terms of uh, servicing Hashem, work, you know, worshiping Hashem, that is the main purpose of Yisrael, you know, of, of why Hashem created the world. The third ingredient or the third idea is that we know that without Torah, there would be no world, okay? We know that, okay? There's, uh, many of you are very familiar with this. It says that we we're taught that Hashem looked in the Torah and he created the world. The way, the, the, the way it reads is his takel, the oraisa, ubara alma. God looked at the Torah and that's how create, he created the world. Well, that so we say usually how we translate that is that so the Torah then is the blueprint but that God used in order to create the world. So that sounds very strange, doesn't it to you? In other words, yes, we know what blueprints are, and the idea is that there was a plan, and so God had to look in a manual, and He looked at this manual, and then He fashioned the world. Sounds. What does this mean? So when you look at the word histakel, histakel means to delve, to contemplate to really look deep, you know, to, to really focus in on something. It doesn't mean to just look at or to peruse. His takel means to really contemplate something. The Torah, what is the Torah? The Torah is a reflection of God's wisdom. What is the Torah? After all, the Torah reflects God's infinite, boundless, limitless wisdom. So the idea is, is that God contemplated and looked in to his, his wisdom as if it was a Torah, okay? And that's where the world comes from, meaning that the world is built on God's wisdom, his infinite wisdom. It also means that the Torah was always there, just like God is eternal, which means no beginning and no end. So to the Torah was always there. It always existed at the same time as, you know, as creation. Okay. Because it's a reflection of God's wisdom. So if God is eternal, so is the Torah and the Torah always exists. So the idea that Torah was always there at the beginning of creation. Now, when we say that God looks in, 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 at his wisdom, reflected you know um in his own wisdom to create the world you have to understand something that the torah that was at the beginning of creation is not the same torah that we have today what the kabbalists call it is a primordial torah in other words the torah that god um access so to speak when he created the world is called a primordial torah there's different ways that they explain it, but I'm going to explain it like this, is that it was a series of letters, of Hebrew letters, that were unin uninterrupted. In other words, they weren't broken. They weren't broken into words. It was just a series of Lashon HaKodesh Hebrew letters that was just went on and on and on. And that was Hashem's wisdom, his Chachma. Now, no one could access that except for Hashem. So the primordial Torah was only accessible to Hashem. Uh, okay, so in, in terms of in that iteration, it's only later on in that form, 
it's only later on when God decides it's the right time and that he has people who are worthy that he will that he will then share his wisdom in a Torah that that people can understand. But at this point in time, at the beginning of creation, the primordial Torah is only accessed by Hashem, and that's how the world is created. So we have three, we have three thoughts of Hashem. We have Hashem's chesed, or three ingredients. I like to give analogies to food all the time. So there's the idea that, that Hashem builds the world on chesed, because that's what he wants to share, and that's what he wants the world to spin on. Olam chesed yibane, the world revolves around chesed. He wants to give it, to bestow it to a people, to humankind, Yisrael, excuse me, who will do the avodah, who will recognize Hashem and who will, will do and service Hashem with the acknowledgement of, of God and the goodness that he bestows on them and appreciate that. Bestows on them and appreciate that. And the idea then also is, is that there is Torah. Torah needs to be there in order for everything to solidify and to take place. And we see something very interesting. We see something, the very, very first word in the Torah is the word bereshit, in the beginning. Okay, the Torah is a reflection of God's wisdom. So every word in the Torah is loaded. Every word in the Torah, you can't just read it on a superficial level. If there's anything extra, if there's something that should be there, there's a reason for that. So the word Bereshit in the beginning, the bet, the letter bet that's in the front is a prefix. Okay, it's a prefix. The word Reshit means first, primary. And really, it could have said Reshit, first, primary, Hashem created heaven and earth, right? That's how the, the sentence reads, the Pasuk reads. But it says bereshit. It uses the prefix bet. Why? Because the prefix bet in Hebrew means bishvil, ba'ad, for the sake of, for the purpose of, for the sake or for the purpose of reshit, the primary, the first thing that was in God's mind. What is considered the first things in God's mind? Yisrael and Torah. Torah was there. And that's God's wisdom and Yisrael. Those are the first ingredients and they were always there. And that's inferred, that's hinted by, by the word Bereshit. Okay. So we know that, let's continue with a little history of the world. Adam and Chava failed in their aboda. They didn't keep that first commandment that Hashem had given them. Okay, they didn't live up to Hashem's command to work and guard and guard God's garden. They didn't live up to that. Okay, if Adam would have been vigilant, and he would have by protecting Hashem's commands, then the whole entire human race. Remember, the whole entire human race is called Yisrael. So the whole entire human race would have been called Yisrael, and we would have gotten the Torah right then and there right then and there at the very, at the get-go, at the very beginning of creation. But since Adam blew it, Adam and Chava blew it, so the essential ingredient of Yisrael is missing, right? It's one of our essential ingredients, it's missing. It's not there. After Adam sins, okay, and we, and we fast forward years, you know, as the years go by, what do we see? That chesed, which is the whole kindness, is the whole underpinning of creation was declining rapidly. And, in, and in instead, instead of kindness and goodness that everybody would have practiced that, we see mankind going downhill into violence and injustice and cruelty. That's what we refer to as Hamas in Hebrew. And that's the trajectory that, that the inhabitants of the world were leading into. And so Hashem brought a mabul, he brought a, he brought a flood into the world. Because after all, the, the whole underpinning of chesed was being undermined by, 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 the, by humanity. So he brought a, a flood into the world to, so, so to speak, to reboot the world. He gave them another chance. But we know that even after the flood, it still continued, mankind still continued to spiral downwards when it came to the, uh, between, act, between acting kindly to one another. And Hashem gave him another chance. 
in the Dor Hafluga, the generation of the tower builders, those were the generation where, I, where Hashem sent this ruach, the spirit of unity amongst the people, because he thought that the people would all band together in unity and would go after Hashem and, and believe in Hashem. But what did they take? What did they do with the spirit of unity? They took that spirit of unity they, and they got together to rebel against Hashem. And hence, they try to build that, that tower to see what was in the heavens and, and that they would fight Hashem in the heavens. So again, in other words, Chesed was totally undermined and, and, and the purpose of creation. So, we, we, so we're missing two essential ingredients right now. Is there is no Yisrael, means there's no Avoda, there's no service of Hashem, and there is no... Um, uh, there and there and there is no chesed, and chesed is perverted at this point. Okay, so with that, now Torah has got to be put on the back burner. In other words, Torah is going to have to wait to make you know to be you know seen in the world. Okay, to when it's going to make its final appearance, because the world was just going downhill at that point. So then, so here we are. We're bereft of the three primary ingredients that that the three primary pillars foundations of the world but then comes our avot our forefathers our patriarchs avraham yitzchak and yaakov and they stepped up to the plate okay they, what they decide they saved the world from doom okay what how because what the greatness of avraham yitzchak and yaakov is that they saw and appreciated hashem in their daily lives that's what Yisrael is a contraction of, me, Shira, Akel. These were individuals who on their own were able to see and appreciate Hashem. They had an understanding of Hashem and their attributes, what they're known for parallel, okay? And what they gave to the world parallel, the three pivotal pillars, the foundations that God wanted for the world. So let's start with Avraham. Okay, we know that Avraham is known for the media, for the attribute of chesed. He saw that from just observing the world. He, there was no one, there was no computer, there were his parents, there was no, his community, there was no, all he saw was idol worship. And he knew that there was something wrong with that. Because what did he see? He saw a beautiful world, a harmonious world. He saw that, that a myriad of kindnesses were being bestowed to the inhabitants of that world. And so he understood that the, whoever the creator is of that world, okay, was a kind a kind creator. And therefore, Avraham decides that I'm going to I am going to emulate, I'm going to copy that midah, that attribute of kindness. And so I so Avram spreads kindness, chesed, into the world. He then has a son named Yitzchak. And he passes, obviously, what you see in your house is what's passed down to your children. So Yitzchak imbibes this chesed, but he has his own approach in terms of Hashem. And all of us, when we think of Yitzchak, Isaac, we right away, we think of sacrifice. We think of Isaac is the epitome. Yitzchak is the epitome of, uh, of, of somebody who was willing to sacrifice himself, a human sacrifice for Hashem. He was a 37 year old man. And he realized that he was going to be the sacrifice that, that his father was going to offer up unto Hashem. And he didn't run away. And he decided that if this is Ritzon Hashem, if this is what Hashem wants, then I am going to do it. I'm going to go through with it. So Yitzchak is known for his midah, his attribute of din, of, of a sense of justice, of what's right, meaning whatever the will of Hashem is, and a sense of givura. Givura here meaning strength against your, your inclination to run away and head for the hills. He, he's able to battle his yetzahara, his evil inclination. And that's what Yitzchak is known for. He is the ultimate, you know, he embodies, you know, the, the ultimate human carbon, the human sacrifice. It's why also, think about it, that when he decides that Esav, his, 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 his redheaded son, should get the bracho, should get the blessings, because he feels Esav needs much more help than his other son, his other son um, Yaakov. And then he realizes that after the blessings are given out, that he was duped. He was tricked and he and that Yaakov ended up getting the blessings and not Asa. There's no ego involved. You don't see anything that says that he got angry. He got upset. He fumed. 
You got nothing. Why? Because Yitzchak's MO, the way Yitzchak operated was, if this, obviously this is the will of Hashem, this is the return of Hashem. And if this is the return of Hashem, I obey it. I go in that direction. So Yitzchak, with his, with his actions, shows us what true avoda, what it means to really serve the Hashem, to really be through your actions, showing how you, how, how in, in other words, your deep belief in, in, in God and, 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 what, and what to do in this world. So along with the Midah, the characteristic of Chesed, and from his grandfather, and then the Mida of Givura or Din or Avoda from Yitzchak, we come to Yaakov. And Yaakov has these two, he has these two characteristics within him, but he has his approach. And we know that Yaakov is associated with Torah. And we know Torah is Torah Emet. It's the Torah of truth. Yaakov is referred to, when he's described in the Torah, he's referred to as an Ishtam Yoshev Ohalem. He's a, he's a complete person. He's, he's complete, and he sits in his tent and he studies Torah. Okay, he doesn't watch video games. He studies Torah. Even when his brother Esav is out to kill him, he, he takes a detour to the yeshiva, to the school of Shem the Aver, and sits there for 14 years to learn. So Yaakov is always associated with Torah and with truth. We know that Yaakov said that when he, that 20 years he lived in the house of Lavan, in Lavan Garti, for 20 years, v'tariyag mitzvot shermarti, and I, and, and I, and I uh, observed all 630 mitzvot. So in other words, the idea here is, is that Yaakov then adds the third component of the foundation of the world, which is Torah. So now we have, Chesed from Avraham, we have Avodah from Yitzchak, and we have we have Torah from Yaakov. And so once again, the the are of you know not once again, but our avot, in other words, are the embodiment embodiment of these three foundations of the world. And these spiritual genes are our Mesora. They are our tradition. They are our spiritual genes that get that gets transmitted to us today because we are the children of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And that's the idea of Masei Avot Simen Lebanim. That that's why the actions of our forefathers, of our patriarchs are so delineated in the Torah, especially in the book of, of Bereshit, of Genesis, because every one of their actions trickles down in the, in the, in, in the following generations. And we have those genes, we have those spiritual genes. So Avraham, and his and and his descendants only through Yitzchak uh, through Yitzchak and Yaakov, okay, would carry forward Hashem's purpose in creation. Okay, from them would come the nation of Israel. Hashem realizes now the whole world is not going to be entitled to the to the to to be called Yisrael. It was only going to be the descendants of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. They were worthy. They were going to keep this going, and they would be called Yisrael. They were going to they were going to be the nation that would accept the Torah. They are the nation that are going to say Naaseh v'Nishma. We will do before we hear any reason for doing it. So they will do a voda. They will they will accept my Torah and they will and they will keep my mitzvot and guard my mitzvot, and that's how we went from the entire human race to a small segment of the human race. In other words, that will be in the embodiment of Chesed, Torah, and Avoda. and these are the three ingredients that sustain the world. Okay. All right. That's the second Mishnah in the Pir Pirkei Avot, right? That the world, you know, let me have it written down some here someplace, somewhere. Um, but I can't find it right now, so I'm not going to do it. But, you know, Ashloshi Devarim HaOlam Omeid, the world's foundation is based on three things, Torah, Avoda, service of Hashem, and Gemila Tchasadim, and acts of kindness towards one another. Okay, so this has been kicked off by our avos. This is implanted in us. 
No. Then it starts, then, then we see in the very first Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, it delineates, it, it, it tells us what, uh, how our Mesorah, what is our Mesorah, what is our tradition. And the Mesorah begins when Moshe receives the Torah at Sinai. Moshe kibel Torah mi Sinai, and then he takes the Torah, okay, as his knowledge of the Torah, and he gives it over to the next leader, which is Yehoshua. And then after that, what we see is tikufot. I never know how to pronounce this, so please ex excuse me if I don't pronounce this correctly. Eras, E-R-A-S, Eras? I don't know, but anyway. Then, he, then after Yehoshua comes different tikufot, different eras. Yehoshua passes it down to the elders, which are called Zikanim. The Zikanim then pass down this, this Torah to the Nevi'im, to the prophets. From the prophets, it goes to the men of the great assembly, Anshei Knesset Hagadola. Okay, so our Misora, okay, our formal tradition starts at Sinai. That's what it tells us in Pirkei Avos. But you have to understand something. This awe-inspiring revelation at Sinai, okay, impacts the entire world. It, the entire world is impacted. It's not only the Jewish people who get the Torah, but the entire world changes. Everything changes. Those first three ingredients, the Torah, Avoda, Gemilas Chasadim, their concepts that we just discussed change. They go from a lower level to a higher level at the time of revelation. Not only that, but Moshe, Rab, Moshe himself changes. Moshe morphs from the person who takes us out of Egypt to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our teacher. So in other words, the, in, so we see here, in other words, that our traditions, our, our Misora, in other words, are they, that each, each era contributes to the stability of the pillars of the world. And let's see what takes place right away at Sinai. How does the three things that we just discussed change drastically? So the first thing, chesed. Chesed changes tremendously. How does chesed change? Okay. The concept changes like this. For the first 2,000 years that people existed in the world, God didn't ask very much from us. He just asked us to acknowledge him. He, okay, that's all he did. And in turn, he would give us this beautiful world with all its amenities and our lives and, and all the enjoyment and everything that we get out of this world. Okay, there were no conditions. There was nothing. That's known as chesed vitur. Chesed that's given freely. Chesed that's given graciously. Chesed that's given by Hashem to us without any conditions. Okay, that was wonderful. But that's a lower level of chesed. Then. At Sinai, when we got the Torah, so what does that, so what happens to Chesed? Oh, Chesed is lifted up because now we can, through our own efforts, by keeping the mitzvot, we we deserve. We we're, we're, we're working for it. We just we 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 deserve to get through our own efforts the Chesed of Hashem. Now Chesed goes to Chesed Mishpat. It's justified Chesed. It's a justified kindness that Hashem gives us because after all, we accepted the Torah and we keep its mitzvahs. So we don't have to feel like shnurrs anymore. We don't have to feel like beggars that every time we called out to Hashem in the first 2,000 years of the world's existence, Hashem gave us our lives and gave us, gave us what we wanted without us earning it. But now at Sinai, we can earn what with all the kindnesses that Hashem benefits from us, that we benefit from, I'm sorry. The next thing that changes drastically is this idea of Yisrael. What's expected of Yisrael? And who is Yisrael? So we, I said we go from in the entire human race to a small segment of the population, but it's at Matan Torah that the parameters of who is a Jew is determined. A Jew is somebody who is, who is born from a Jewish mother. That is at that point of Sinai. That's the, the structure of what a Jew is, you know, who is considered a Jew. Up until that point, you had a Jewish mother. I mean, you, you, we really weren't even a nation. So if you, you saw Hashem and appreciated Hashem, whether you, your mother, father, didn't make a difference. But by Sinai, your mother was the one that was determining whether you were Jewish or not. 
but wait, there's more, okay? We, the first 2000 years of our existence, all mankind who, was, who could have been Israel, we were like princes and princesses in the palace. What's expected of a prince or a princess? That they act dignified, okay? And that they don't, you know, and, and they do what the, what the king demands of them and what's befitting of their position. There's really very few rules that they have to adhere to, okay? That's the same thing that was true with mankind. Mankind at the first two, 2,000 years, what did Hashem give mankind? Seven mitzvot, seven Noahide laws. And out of those laws, four, four, four of them was for, so that the world could continue to function. Don't steal, don't kill. I mean, uh, you, know, you know, don't steal, don't kill. You set up a court system. Um, you know, without them, the world couldn't exist. Two of them have to do with the idea of acknowledging Hashem, which is the whole reason that Hashem created the world, and that is for our benefit. And one of them, not eating the, the, the limb of a live animal, is so that we should that we should restrain ourselves in our animalistic instincts so that we can live amongst people and, 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 and the world could go on. So there were seven laws that we had to uphold for the first 2,000 years of existence. That was it. But at Sinai, wait a minute. It's a whole different, the game changes because now we have 613 mitzvot. Not only do we have 613 mitzvot, but we also have, we also have the, 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 the oral law that we need to accept, which tells us the myriad of details on how to keep all the things that are written in the 613 mitzvot from the Torah. Well, that was tremendously overwhelming to us Jewish people. How do we know? Because Rashi tells us that, 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 that Hashem had to, it like it, he took the mountain like a it was like a barrel and he placed it over our heads and he says if you don't accept the Torah in its entirety the written Torah and the oral Torah here's where you're going to die so this was the last chance that the world had in order to survive because had the Jews not not accepted the Torah in its entirety the world would have ceased to exist this was the last chance the world would have ceased to exist. So we did, we said Na'asev and Ishma, we did accept everything. And we realized that now we, as a Yisrael, we have tremendous responsibilities and obligations and, we are in, and we're partners with Hashem in moving the world forward. So the nature of Yisrael, and of course our avoda. We go from seven mitzvot to 613 with a lot of little details to it, changes drastically as well. Now, Torah. Remember, we discussed the primordial Torah, which only Hashem could access. This idea of a string of letters without any breaking in, without any interruption or break in them. Okay, so now the whole, the nature of Torah changes. What do I mean by that? I don't mean the nature of Torah, but rather, what does Hashem do? He... The Torah has to speak to man. That's the, 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 the vehicle by which we connect to Hashem, to Hashem's wisdom. So Hashem had to make it so that it's comprehensible to us. Before that primordial Torah was not comprehensible. We couldn't understand that. So in the permanent version, in the Torah that we have today, which is the same Torah that, was, that, would, that Moshe got at Sinai, is the same exact Torah. Hashem did that. The, the Torah speaks in the language of man. He, 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 God made it in such a way, as you know, that we can access it and that we could understand Hashem to the best that we can understand Hashem. Um, and and, and that, that's the nature of Torah. Moshe changes drastically. Now, it's an interesting thing. When you think about revelation, what do you think about? It's a very unusual uh, phenomena because we, what do we say? We said Hashem appeared on the mountain. We say that very glibly, but when you think about it, that's pretty awesome. We were taking a, a totally spiritual being, a totally infinite, boundless, you know, being, and he's, and this, not he, but this being is meshing with the physical world. He's, He's, he's communicating with the people. He's on the mountain there. So that's an incredible, that, that, that's an incredible event. That's an incredible revelation. So what is it that Hashem did? Hashem took his infinite wisdom 
And he broke it down into little bite-sized pieces. We call them words, okay? And he puts them into words. And that's, and, and remember, that's the reflection of God's wisdom. And he's able to take, Hashem takes, it's miraculous. He takes his wisdom and he breaks it down and he gives us this Torah so that we should be able to access Hashem's wisdom. That's tremendous. In other words, now we have 600,000 600, letters on a piece of parchment that we have the ability to delve into. That's, that's the Torah that we have now. So how does that affect Moshe? You know that Moshe was a kavad pet. It was difficult for him to speak. And when I say this, let's be clear about this. I know we, we teach our children, he had a lisp, this, that. It means that he wasn't able to articulate or communicate that effectively, okay? He wasn't able to do that, all right? So you, when you think about it, you think out of all the people that existed in the world, Hashem picks an individual who, has a, who, has, who is unable to communicate effectively and articulate as the spokesperson to go to, Fer, to, go to Paro, to, to take the Jews out of Egypt, to be the, the motivational speaker to the Jewish people to say, we're, we're going to do it, we're going to get out, you know, we're going to get out, you know, out, and then leave them out of Egypt. What's the idea here? What is the idea here? So the idea here is, is that you have to understand that Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe was on a very high spiritual level from the get-go. In other words, he was in a different plane of existence. We know that, 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 that in fact, his, his, his parents, his mother right away saw that when he was born, he was called Tuvia, right? Okay, we, we, we see, in other words, there was something special about this child. And so Moshe's whole existence was on a spiritual realm. And so therefore, things that are of a spiritual nature are very hard to articulate. Things of that, you know, they're very hard to explain. What it's like is like Holocaust survivors. My, my parents were Holocaust survivors. They never spoke about the Holocaust. Why? So you have all these trite things, oh, because it brings a pain. But no, because the, the, the experience was so overwhelming and so incredible that to put it into words wasn't going to explain anything. It wasn't going to, in other words, you, you wouldn't understand what it was. So they never spoke, and they didn't. They never spoke about what they went through, ever. You kind of overheard things like if you were a kid and you were sitting outside of a room and they were whispering or something like that, then you heard something, but they never really spoke about anything. And so to Moshe, Moshe was on that realm, on that plane, on that level where of, of, of spirituality, where he never, where the speech wasn't his forte, it wasn't his strength. But once and, and he knows that, by the way, he knows that because when Hashem appear, you know, tells him numerous times, he says, Moshe, you are going to be the one. You've got to go to Pharaoh. You've got to do it. You've got to, you know, um, you've got to take the people. And Moshe says, me, me, you're picking me. I'm a Kavad Peh. I, 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 can, I can't do it. And then Hashem tells him numerous times, okay, Moshe, I know that. So Aharon is going to be your mouthpiece. Aharon is going to speak for you. Your brother is going to speak for you. But when I, and at Sinai, when Hashem performs this miracle where he takes his infinite wisdom and he's able to, to, to contain it into a, a physical, in a, um, a, a spirit, his spiritual wisdom into a, infi, uh, into a finite physical form that we know as the Torah today, that freed Moshe. In other words, Moshe then was able to speak. And we see from the time that Moshe gets, you know, he receives the Torah from Hashem. What does the Torah tell us? Ela hadzibarim asher diber Moshe. These are the words, these are the things that Moshe said. He becomes Moshe, from Moshe the leader, he becomes Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher. He's able to teach, he's able to articulate, he's able to explain, he's able to do what he needs to do. Because, it's, it, because now God has taken the infinite spiritual and put it into physical form. And he's able to draw upon that and then give it over to the people. Please understand something. 
I'll just say this really very quickly because I see time is kind of eluding me. <laughs> um, and, and that is, and I just like this analogy and I, it might be very elementary for some of you, but remember something, God's wisdom is infinite. It has no boundaries. So if we take God's wisdom and we picture it as a pitcher, like a huge pitcher of water, okay? And then we have a big, big, you know, a big cup, like a big gulp from 7-Eleven. And you take Hashem's wisdom in the form of the pitcher and you pour it into the big gulp, into that big cup of water. That cup of water will hold Hashem's wisdom up until it, the capacity you could hold it. But if you keep on pouring, it just spills all over. It can't hold anymore. So Moshe was only, Moshe still was a physical human being. So he was able to receive who kibel. It doesn't say that Hashem masar, that he transmitted but rather he received in whatever fashion, we don't know the exact mechanism by which Moshe received the Torah from Hashem, but Moshe Kibel, he received the Torah from Hashem and he was like a vessel who held as much as he, he, he could. And then whatever he knew, he gave over to Yoshua, Yoshua to the elders, the elders to the, um, to the Nevi'im, to the prophets and so on and so forth. Okay, after, after Moshe, then comes Yehoshua. There were many other people. I, there, were, there must have been other people who would have been worthy to take over after Moshe, but it's Yehoshua who is considered the Mesharis, the servant of Moshe. He's not only the disciple of Moshe, but he's the servant of Moshe. He's the one to lead B'nai Israel. And what does Hashem say? Hashem says, Rashi, um, the Medrash tells us, he says to Moshe, he says, you know how much Yehoshua served and honored you. Okay, he arrived at your tent early and left late in order to arrange the chairs and spread the mats because they, the other, you know, the serpent, would, they would sit on mats on the floor for the other students. In other words, he wasn't only concerned with what his knowledge, he was concerned with everybody. Excuse me? Can I continue? Okay, thanks. Okay, so Yahushua then is the one who will assume your office, says Hashem, because he not only was concerned, you know, be, uh, concerned about how much knowledge, but he was your Mishares. He served you and he served the Jewish people. So he's the next one to take over. And that's what differentiates Yahushua from any of the great people that were in that, that, that lived in that generation. After Yehoshua dies in the book of Shoftim, we have the elders that take over. There are many of them. There's not one, there, there's usually, we refer to them as 70. And they, they, they get together when they need to, you know, in, in terms of uh, adjudicating or whatever they needed to do. But they also were very in sync with the, di with the different shvatim that they represented kind of like congressmen, okay, you know, or senators. They, they are in tune with their constituency, with their shvatim. And that's what they, and so that made a little bit more accessible to people that they were able to consult or they were able to at least have zikanim in their midst and um, who would, would then, who knew what the culture was of that sheva. After, and they and the zikanim were responsible for the accuracy of our Masorah being passed down as all the, the, the errors were. After them comes the Nevi'im. Okay, what, what are Nevi'im? The Nevi'im are special kind of people who had experienced direct knowledge, listen to this carefully, who experienced direct knowledge of Hashem while still here on earth. Okay, direct knowledge of Hashem while still, still here on earth. Their minds, their human minds and God's wisdom were connected Okay, we're connected through special angels known as Ishim, because they would connect to Ish, to, to man. These were special angels. It was like a catalyst. They were catalysts that connected Hashem's wisdom to their wisdom while they were here on earth. This usually took the form of a dream at night or a vision during the day. This is the highest level of, 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 of communication, of speech on, uh, that could possibly exist in the in in the world um that 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 in, in terms of god communicating to man directly a navi is called a navi from the phrase niv nun yud bet sifatayim 
okay, which means the fruit of the lips. Ever hear of tenuva? Tenuva means the fruit, the fruit of the earth, tenuva, same, same shoresh. Niv sifatayim means the fruit of the lips. In other words, God would communicate his, uh, you know, would communicate with the Navi. The Navi would get the, the communication and then he would be the spokesperson giving it over to the people, okay? So in other words, what Navua prophecy would well up inside of the Navi and then he would in turn, it would, it would be manifested through the Navi's lips. It would come out of the Navi's lips. So Navua is a speech or a communication on a very high level that starts from Hashem. It doesn't start, the origin isn't from man. It starts from Hashem and then it's expressed by the Navi here on earth, okay? Please understand something. There was a thousand years in the history of the world where we prophecy existed. There were a million prophets. There wasn't a community during that period of time that didn't have its own prophet. And prophecy takes on, there's many different kinds of prophecies. And one of the kinds was there's a personal prophecy. Okay, that the idea with that is you see, people would saddle their donkeys, and if they had a personal question, um, maybe they, they were perplexed as to which direction they needed to go, they were confused about something, they needed guidance, they needed, they needed to uh, something on behalf of themselves, on behalf of a member of their families, whatever they needed, they literally could go to their local Navi and 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 and, and beseech and ask. You know, you just tell them what was what was troubling them, and then the Navi would get a personal prophecy, okay, a communication from Hashem, and so this way hum, the, the the human being would know what Hashem's expectations from them were. It was a, a tremendous system of really knowing what Hashem wants from us. Could you imagine if we had that today to really know what Hashem really wants from us? And that's really what it was like in when we had prof, prophets. The last, it's not the last, but the last mentioned in Pirkei Avot, the last Tikufa, the last era mentioned in Pirkei Avot is the era of the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the great assembly. Now this is going to be wild, so stay tuned for the ride because I know it's getting late here. Okay, the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the great assembly, okay, were, were visionaries. They were, they were, they were, <laughs> There were 120 of them sitting on what the men of the great assembly were the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, the Grand Court. A normal Sanhedrin, a normal court, only consisted of 70 of the wisest and uh, smartest uh, you know, men of the time. But the Anshe Knesset Hagadol, the men of the great assembly, was a souped up Sanhedrin. And they made a lot of enactments to ensure that Judaism would continue. Enactments that we still keep up today, that you're familiar with, like the idea of muktzah. There are things that we can't touch on Shabbos because we it might come, it might lead us to transgress the Shabbos. We shouldn't go two days without reading the Torah, so we read the Torah on Mondays, Thursday, and Shabbos from the Torah. Um, we know the idea of kiddush, the kiddush that we make at the meals on Shabbos, our our, our sitter. Okay, the way it's it, you know the, the way it's uh, assembled and the order and what we say. That's all the enact. I mean, that's not all, but that's the enactments of the 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 um, takanot. It's called that the Anshe Knesset Hagadola did. Okay, but wait, there's more. Let's get a little deeper into this. We said we began our class that the world spins because of three things: Torah, Avoda, and Gemilut Chasadim. Okay. We see that Sinai, the revelation at Sinai, really strengthened Chesed, really strengthened Yisrael and Avoda, because we have, you know, and, 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 and gave us a Torah that was accessible to us. It was pivotal. It was pivotal in, in, for the whole world. But what would happen as the world would progress if any one of these pillars, if any one of these foundations would start to teeter, you know, would, 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 start, would start teetering? would be shaky, would be unstable. What would happen if one of those pillars just started to crumble? The world could no longer support itself, right? The Mishnah says the world stands on these three things. If one of them gets a little shaky, then the world would, would just cr crumble and not be able to support itself. 
During the period of time when the Anshe Knesset Hagadola, the men of the Great Assembly, existed, they witnessed the crumbling of one of these pillars that hold up the world. And they took dramatic, dramatic steps to save the pillar that we know as Avoda. Let me tell you how, to the best of anybody's ability of understanding this. It was the pillar of Avoda, okay, of, of how, you know, of, of, of our service, of our actions, the whole reason we were put in this world that was in jeopardy and was, 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 was falling apart. The Gemara tells us that, now, please understand this, that the entire human race, okay, was tormented. The entire human race was tormented by the temptation of idolatry, of idol worship. Do you know what we call idol worship in Hebrew? Avoda Zara, strange worship. Avoda Zara, the whole world was given over to this idea of worshiping these carvings, statues, uh, signs, uh, all, all of the all, all of all symbols, images. Because the truth is, is that the, the temptation was so great, and it was it, it was so people were so drawn to it that there is some intrinsic energy in these things. There is some sort of meaning in these things, but they're wrong, okay? They're perverted. They're, they're, in other words, that if you tap into the energy of these things, then it leads to destru your destruction and to oblivion, to Gehenna. So the temptation of the world just towards these things, to, towards Abodazara, outstripped man's ability to fight with them. Okay, they couldn't overcome it. It was so strong. Now we can't wrap our heads around this. We can't because because Anshe Knesset Hagadola, what they were able to do was literally, okay, is to rip out from our human consciousness, from our human psyche, this idea of a Vodazara to the point that we think it's ridiculous. When we teach it to the students, it sounds ridiculous that, that they should have a urge to do this kind of thing. Because Anshe Knesset HaGadola was able to literally take the lowest forms of Avodah Zara, the basest forms of bowing down and the whole, all the ugly uh, practices that went around, that, that came along with Avodah Zara, and they were able to eradicate it, to cut it out, to exorcise it, like an exorcist, from, from, the, from human consciousness, consciousness. And that's why today we are not able to comprehend Avodah Zara. But here was the mindset of, 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 um, of the Anshe Knesset Sagadola to Avodah Zara. This is a losing battle. The ordeal, what's going on here is that people are left and right just are falling by the wayside and, and, and are running to worship this, this strange worship, this strange Avodah, the strange service. So they felt that they had to be proactive. They had to do something. That's what leaders really are. They're proactive and they needed to do something about this. And so they did. What they did were, remember, these were the greatest minds of the time, the greatest spiritual minds of the time, the visionaries of the time. They got together, says the Gemara, okay? And they, they performed a mystical ceremony where they were able to call up the divine names of Hashem, okay? The divine names. If you ever, okay, most of us are familiar, well, we're not really familiar with it, but we know that the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, the high priest on Yom Kippur, there is a name of a God that's called the ineffable name. It's not pronounceable, okay? It has a string of many, many letters. And literally it was, it was, well, it was said by the high priest on Yom Kippur. But what that means really was is that the high priest opened up his mouth and it just came forth because you can't pronounce it, it's ineffable. So we understand that name. But if you ever look by Duchening, um, Birkat Kohanim, <laughs> sorry, by, uh, by Birkat Kohanim, and there's paragraphs in between it, it tells you that when you, if you read those paragraphs, that there are names there. There are these, these mystical names and we should never say them. We shouldn't pronounce them. We just kind of like sight read them if you want. 
So the Anshe Knesset Agdola, who was so in tune to Hashem and spirituality, they had this mystical ceremony where they were able to, 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 to call up these divine names, okay? And, and the Yetzer, the, a Yetzer is a drive, a force, an energy, okay? So the Yetzer of, of the human energy of Avodah Zara comes flaming out. Listen from the Kodesh HaKadoshim, from the holiest of holies, where it lived. It lived, it existed, this energy, this force, this spirit lived in the holiest, in most intensely profound spiritual place on earth, the holiest of holies, the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Yetzer, the drive for Avodah Zara, that's where it, it, it came out. The, the Anshe Knesset Hagudola was able to, to destroy it, kill it, and that Yetzer, that drive, that force left the world. Now you all must have a question here. Why would the basest, the lowliest Avoda, Avoda Zara, that of Avoda Zara, why would it reside in the holiest of places? Okay, in the most exalted of places in the Kodesh HaGadoshim. And listen very carefully, please. Because that Yetzer, that energy, that source, okay, is the same source that leads us in the direction of doing avoda, the highest that we want to go in the higher spiritual levels. So we want to do avoda Hashem. It's the same source. It's the same energy. It's the it's it's the same it's the same thing that leads us in the direction to go in a lower direction, away from Hashem, to the lowest and to the to the lowest source to that of Avodah Zara. So it's like a continuum in a way. It's an energy that either we can climb up on and onward spiritually to Avodah Hashem, or we can be, we, 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 we draw ourselves to the opposite end of the continuum, to the opposite end of the energy, which is the lowest form of Avodah, which we know as Avodah Zara. Let me explain this idea even more clearly to you, to the best of my ability. Hashem, when he created man, we all, all of us have the need, okay, to go beyond ourselves. We have the need to transcend, is how we say it in English, to transcend ourselves. In other words, we all want to go beyond our little phys physical existence. We want our existence to have more meaning. And the way things have more meaning is if we break through the confines of the physical, of the physical world that we live in, okay? Everybody has that kind of need. And that's why we see that for the most part, the world's population believes in some kind of God, okay? They believe in some kind of God. What's this need to believe in some kind of God? Because if you believe in some kind of God, then you're not boxed in you have an, you, you know, you're not boxed into your, 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 your little life or your, your life of getting up in the morning, you know, eating breakfast, going to work and, and going home or whatever it is. But in other words, you are able to connect to something bigger than you, bigger than you. You have an otherworldly experience. You have something that that's what we call on a spiritual level. You transcend, you go above, you go upwards. Okay. Um, that's the highest level. That's the higher level. That's the avoda God. That that's the pillar of the world that God had in mind. That makes the world spin. But on the other hand, that same energy, that same source, that same yetzer, that drive, can also make you. And this is going to sound funny, but go beyond break through the barriers that are below, that are downwards, that are basely, that are below, okay? And it makes us, and it doesn't make us do anything. We choose to follow those downward, that, that downward avoda, which will end up leading to our own destruction in Gehenna. The only, I mean, I'm sure there's many, you know, for example, you know, that, for example, Kishuf, magic, 
there is such a phenomena as magic in the world. There's a koach, there's a force called magic. The Torah absolutely forbades us to access that energy, to use that energy. By the same token, when you have for, I, I, I'm told, um, hallucinogen, I think you didn't say right, drugs that, uh, that are hallucinatory. <laughs> okay, what do they cause? They cause you to go beyond yourself. They cause you, in other words, to have a, 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 an experience that's otherworldly. Even dr drinking, people who excessively drink, why do they excessively drink? Because they love the taste of the alcohol? No, they don't love the taste of the alcohol. You ever smell alcohol? It smells terrible to me. But at any rate, but it, it causes you, to, it frees you. It causes you to be break the, 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 the ties that bind you. And it allows you to, in other words, to experience something that you normally wouldn't be able to experience. And that is the Yetzer, the drive that existed for, Av for Avodah Zarah, which is the lowest form, as well as the same drive can take you to the highest form, which is Avodah Hashem, to serve Hashem. So where, how, where do you go? Well, each of us have our own minds and our own, you know, and our own faculties. Some of us gravitate in one direction to a lower direction. People you see gravitate to a lower direction and there are people who gravitate to a higher direction. We have free choice. That's what makes us humankind. That's what makes us so, so different than anything else God created. So this idea then is, is that that's why this Yetzer, this drive for Abodazara was so powerful that it was going to reside, it was going to live okay, in the most powerful spiritual place in the world. And what's the most powerful spiritual place in the world? The Kodesh HaKadoshim. That's the Avoda. That Avoda, if once you're getting rid of Avoda Zara, which is one end of the spectrum, one end of the energy, source, koach, force, yetzer, then by definition, you can't get rid of only half of it, you have to get then, then also what's destroyed with it is the highest level. What's the highest level of spirituality? That of nivua, prophecy. Prophecy, which is the direct communication we said between Hashem and a human being in this world, there is no more prophecy. The last of the prophets existed, were in the time of the men of the great assembly, you know, who were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And after that, prophecy was no more. So this was the cost that we had to pay, okay, that man had to pay for the, for the men of the great assembly to re-stabilize this pillar of Avoda, this pillar, one of that, that was teeter-tottering, that, that if, if, if we, the whole world would have crumbled if we all would have gone in the direction of Avoda Zara. But we had to give up our, we had to give up this, the ability to C communicate with Hashem directly and know what he wanted from us through Nebuah. And this way, the pillar of Avoda was intact. So in conclusion, okay, it's our Torah, Avoda, and Gemila Chasadim that sustains the world today. And we women have a tremendously big share in all three arenas, in all three facets, all three pillars of the world, of sustaining the world. When it comes to Gemila Tchasadim, doing kindnesses, acts of kindness, we're the heavy lifters. We do the practical work. We're the ones who wake up with the children. We're the ones who tend to do the children much more. We're the ones who prepare the mitzvah meals. We're the ones who do the errands. We are the ones who are occupied with the practical aspects of doing chesed. That's not to say that men don't do chesed. Sure, ask them. They'll write out a check. They'll give you cash. But we're the ones that take the raw product and make it into something usable as chesed. We say, here, you just had a baby, here's a Shabbos meal, something you can eat. Not money, but something that you can eat. So when it comes to chesed, we women are at the forefront. When it comes to avoda, we women have such an impact on the world. We set the tone for our household, 
our environment, our friends, uh, our colleagues in the business. We set a tone. Every one of our our actions sets a certain um, sets a certain atmosphere that impacts the people that we engage with. In other words, what we bring as women to the table is that we make Judaism a living experience. That's what we do. It's not only complying with the mitzvot, that's what a voda is in service of Shem, but it's creating that atmosphere of warmth, a flavor of a sense of what a mitzvah is, how we go about preparing for Yom Tov that's coming up, a holiday that's coming up, how we present ourselves to the world, that's going to that and and everybody who comes in contact with us notices that they learn from that they don't say anything but it but it's absorbed it's absorbed by your children it's absor absorbed by your friends it's absorbed by your environment it's, it's absorbed with everything that you come in contact with that's our avoda it's it's what we learn from sarah sarah created a, 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 an atmosphere where her the light, her Shabbos lights on Friday night would last from one week to the other. She created a light. Her home was full of light. She her bread never staled. It was always fresh. What is it a metaphor for? That her mitzvot, when she did mitzvot, they weren't routine. They had effervescence. They were fresh. They never staled. And the cloud of glory, the Anan, where Hashem resided at that point was on top of her tent because God was comfortable there. She made her environment comfortable for Hashem to be there. That's the avodza we as women invest in and are good at and what we have to offer to keep the world afloat. And Torah, well, Torah, we are responsible. We have an obligation. We have, they tr we have, they, we are entrusted with a like we are entrusted with major aspects of Judaism. The three hallmarks of the Jewish home, Shabbos, Kashrut, family purity laws. We have to know all of the details, all of the laws that are pertaining to that. And we are the ones that, that, that keep that up. We're the ones, in other words, had, had, you know, that Adam trusted his wife Chava when she gave him to the fruit from the tree, he didn't ask, well, is it kosher? He assumed it was kosher. That's what we do. We are, we are responsible for not only our own knowledge in Torah and all of the laws that pertain to us and our families, but we're also responsible for sending our children to schools and, to, and perpetuating the, the Torah in, in, in our lives. And so with that, let me say that we women, we Jewish women are very instrumental in being God's partner, in moving the world forward by investing in Torah, Abodah, and Gemilus Chasadim, and to continue what our, uh, the Masorah, the tradition our Avot started, and that was passed down to the guardians of our Masorah, that we today are the guardians. We, 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 are, we are the guardians of our Mesorah, and we are the best gardeners of Gan Eden, of God's garden today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Weiser. That was okay. Sorry, very I uplifting. took a little bit long, but there were a lot of nice ideas, I thought. Okay, <laughs> you hopefully. Gone on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.